but there's also this other semiotic pulse, which is who are the people that buy these organic products, these super green products, the Priuses? The movie stars are the first. Movie stars? Okay. People who live in Portland. <laughs> Who's telling me about Portland just the other? There's a radical Portland person here. Oh, he's not here. Uh, it was like Portland's the greatest place on earth. Um, okay, people in Portland, movie stars. Well, what, you know, when movie stars do it, that, that has an interesting effect. If we're going to say movie stars, for instance, are going to s solve our crisis, right? Movie stars are going to go out there and they're going to tell us we're poisoning, we're poisoning the atmosphere. Okay, you think that's going to work? Well, it could. There's a lot of people that really follow trends of movie stars. Leo DiCaprio has, has done a film. Uh, Jude Law has done a film. Cameron Diaz has done a film. There's a lot of these, uh, you know, save, you know, uh, Sean Penn, save the, say polar bears, save panda bears, save water, save, and they're they're out there doing it. But one of the problems with movie stars doing it is when a movie star drives an electric car like an all-electric car. Some people go, wow, okay, they're available. Other people go, uh, you know, I'm not like that individual. I'm not Tom Hanks. Right, it was great, uh, the, who killed the electric car, uh, Chris Payne. I'm not like that movie star. Only, only people with incredible amounts of money and fame could possibly drive an electric car. Because, let's be honest, if I'm in an electric car and it breaks down, People aren't just going to stop and help me, necessarily. But if Cameron Diaz is in an electric car and it breaks down, I, you can imagine the amount of people that will stop and help her. They'll carry her to the nearest you know, charging station. They'll bring cords from miles away and plug it in. They'll all be talking about it forever. Jack Nicholson. Imagine him stuck on the side. Who wouldn't stop for Jack Nicholson? And you find out he's in an electric car. You're like, wow, what can I do to bring you electricity? And whatever you're doing that entire day, you will tell everyone you know, well, me too, that hey, I, I, I'm looking for electricity for Jack Nicholson. And the next thing you know, they've got this swarm of friends all helping to go and meet Jack on the side of the road. So people don't think necessarily, the Hollywood thing does create some interest and it does create a certain directive. But for the people that, it, it, that, that, that buy into it, there is a whole other group that say, you know, they're elitist and they're special, and I don't necessarily know how to relate to them. So the idea that they were driving around an electric car means that they're privileged. A lot of the, these organic products cost more. These green products cost more. They cost a lot, they, they, so I could buy a shitty burger for, they sell for 99 cents, and it does everything to crush the, the vessels in my body, in my heart. Or I could spend triple the amount for a salad with organic, you know, with some strips of chicken from a chicken that lived one of the best lives I've ever known. That had lots of friends. And, you know, we've all seen Portlandia. Grew up on, you know, perfect farm. Died of natural causes. Uh, you know, whatever. So, if I, if, here's a question. If you're going to feed the world, would you use a technology like Wonder Bread? Or would you use organically produced uh, 14 grain uh, whole wheat or, you know, uh, bread? Well, it depends on, on what aspect you're thinking. If, if you're, you know, the businessman and thinking about, you know, cost and, you know, and production and all that, then obviously Wonder Bread is going to be your go-to because it's, you know, streamlined production as opposed to you know, artisanal crafted bread. Yeah, okay. Um, well, I'm sure everyone has very strong opinions about this. How long did it take us to make Wonder Bread? Uh, 20 years. 20. Starting from the invention of bread. Okay, I would die, that's pretty good. <laughs> Wonder, bread. <laughs> Wonder Bread. Wonder Bread was around since we were, I mean, the, we Wonder Bread is a kind of culmination of thousands of years of farming and industrialization, population growth, uh, preserving shelf life, nutrients, 
vitamins, enrichment, every kind of absurd technology. Maybe not much genetic modification, but I wouldn't be surprised if that happened. Uh, to give you something that has a lot of bang for, uh, you know, because it doesn't cost anything. It's crazy what that can feed. Kids, uh, you know, I was teaching at Columbia University. I was kind of shocked that we got into this. This is how I got into the discussion. Uh, the kids there, uh, you know, we, we take in some kids from Harlem who are really poor, and they do grow up in projects, and they get to take some classes at Columbia. And they absolutely would never buy the 13 grain or 14 grain organic whole wheat bread. To them, it didn't taste good, it wasn't cool, and it wasn't even on their radar, and who would pay that much for bread? And Wonder Bread was absolutely cool. And you know, they, they were, they were, these were college kids, they were in their 20s, not like young kids. When you're young, everything, you know, m and you could live off of that the rest of your life. This was, they were, they were absolutely sure that Wonder Bread was for them. So there's a different lesson there as far as a cultural lesson. Um, but as a technology lesson, we wanted, we wanted, we were thinking about issues of sustainability. I, I have to get to that word. I'm going to do that in a minute. I'm going to do that in a minute. Uh, sustainability. So Wonder Bread, uh, Wonder Bread is an unbelievably good delivery mechanism to bring uh, this kind of nutrient to lots of people, travel long distances with it, and have a very long shelf life, and there it is. And some people might argue that's, that's not good for you, and there are certain things in it maybe aren't that are well, there's a lot of things in it that aren't good for you. Process, flour, etc. I, mean, I get it. We all get it. At the same time, though, we need to feed uh, uh, a group of people in a nation that have no access to food, this might be one delivery mechanism. But it, it got it got to where it is because we evolved it to do that. Now we're trying to undo that very system, and food is just one topic in a whole series of topics that deal with this environmental crisis. It's food, there's waste, there's water, there's mobility, there's technology, there's infrastructure, there's economics. It's just one of the, the meta themes Food, we could probably talk, uh, we easily can talk, we can get a degree. We're offering a degree now in food technology and food distribution. I mean, it's a, uh, Michael Pollan, it's, a, it's an industry. Industry of whether we should go organic or not. So, in many cases, I would say probably the best answer, I had a, a, a doctoral student at NYU, had probably one of the best answers I've seen in a long time, which is attach our food problem to our Healthcare. Most health problems come from the shit that we eat. Our nutrition, and we're talking America specifically, not necessarily Canada or Europe, but it, it, it's affected a lot of other places. The, our nutrition affects our health. And I would say probably, uh, I think the, the number was around 25 to 30 percent of all life threatening diseases comes from uh, our nutrition, our diet. So that, that and, and, and some of it you can't avoid. So connecting it to a socialized healthcare system did seem like a very interesting start at tackling two very big, difficult problems. So one might think that would be a kind of curious answer. I see Michael Pollan uh, do his, uh, his glass of, of crude oil routine. Does anyone know this? this um, anyone know who Michael Pollan is? Mike, I, I'm just going to read. I'll constantly shoot out names, write them down, check them out. But uh, big foodie. Uh, he took out in one of his lectures. He took out four glasses, and he filled the first one with. Oh, he put out a burger. Sorry, I forgot that. Puts a burger on the table. Big, juicy, horrible <coughs> burger. Sorry, I'll go over here. Big juicy horrible burger. It says, "How many glasses of crude oil does it take to make this burger?" And he fills up the four glasses with crude oil. They're much bigger than this. And then he drinks the last glass. Just so everyone goes, "Oh!" And it was, "It's nothing but chocolate syrup." And okay, fine. But that he was letting us know that that's how much oil it takes to make a burger. I love those kinds of informatic lessons. Sometimes they don't always hammer home. 
but that's, that, uh, that gives you a kind of realization. So uh, another informatic lesson actually might be, well, I'll, I'll ask you and then later on we'll go how much, how much waste does um, New York City produce in one day? Could you even picture how much waste is it? And how important is it for you to picture it? And will that possibly get you to change things? I just told you it took four glasses, or Michael Pollan just told you it took four glasses of crude oil to make a burger. Are you still going to eat burgers? No. I want to see the calculation. You want to see the calculation? I don't have the copy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I'll, I'll go to the source. Yeah. I mean, you can add it up. I mean, if you count the packaging, I can see where that would add the and extra. Transportation of, you know, all yeah. the materials. The whole system. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of the things we're doing, uh, we, so I, I'll get into some of my own work, but it was, that's not what this, the class is about. Uh, I, I have a, a group called Genspace that I, I founded years ago. We're the first synthetic biology community laboratory in the U.S., if not the world. And we tweak things for fun, not to make weapons, although that could happen. Um, we use synthetic biology for design. So um, it was originally BioWorks. Uh, my roommate at Harvard, Dr. Oliver Medvedek, he went to the medical school. Uh, um, we came together years later and found some kind of reason where you would have two very different disciplines sit next to each other and work on problems. One of the problems they're working on is the food problem, where we're expressing certain proteins and hemoglobin found commonly in Arachidopsis. Uh, I never pronounced exactly right, Arachidopsis. Basically, growing plants to make meat. So vegetarians will be able to eat all the meat they want because it came from a plant and it tastes identical to meat itself. For all intents and purposes, if you trace uh, going back to eukaryotes where plants and animals switched, you can go back to the evolutionary chain, find what they had in common, and re-express that synthetic group, the Hox gene. Has that been? Is it a concept, or is it then actually? It's more than a concept, and it, we're not, you know, we're not going to mass produce it. But what we do is we produce concepts to the point of uh, uh, of demo or prototype, and then have what happens? Have you eaten it though? Um, no, we have not eaten it. We're still expressing <laughs> it to run through thousands of cycles. <laughs> but would you eat it? I've tried soy uh, soy based meats. I'm pretty good at well, not 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 trying to take a vegetable or some or a bean or whatever, and make it taste food. like meat. Okay. But I'm taking so we can grow everything that we know about meat, including that bloody taste you get at the end, because that's the hard part. That's the hemoglobin. Uh, so that the last part in the back of your tongue, where you, there's some visceral connection, your instincts kick in, like I just got some meat. But that's <laughs> not the last component. It's because it really is meat, but it was grown in the plant but just a specific part. So part also a big part of that research is, is creating uh, the texture and, and uh, the, the, uh, the cellular tapestry in direct alignment so you get the same feel. But a lot of that could be also built into molds and shape it. It's not, it's, this is not new. There are a lot of people out there trying to make fake meat. I mean, the P PETA ha has a, a $1 million prize for anyone who could do it. I mean, you, everyone can do it. Making in vitro meat has been done. It just it tastes really bad. And the sources are difficult and expensive and take a lot of fuel, uh, take a lot of energy to transit the fuel. Most, most meat that you get today in vitro is reproduced through a form of cancer. Most cellular reproduction is just can cancer is everywhere. It's, it's, how we, uh, it's just part of our lives. It's when it, it kind of clusters in an abnormal way that it becomes dangerous. If you want to make copies of an immortal cell line, it's called an immortal cell line because you, you basically induce it with a form of cancer and repeat it endlessly. So you can get, you can repeat uh, uh, extracellular matrix from pigs and get bacon or beef jerky, or at least that same cellular structure made in the test tube. It tastes horrible. Not maybe because I know that there's something to do with cancer in it, but also 
there's a million things wrong with it that are different when meat is made from an animal that runs around or walks around very slowly until someone kills it. Do you have angel investors, Roy, that are, are hoping to make a billion dollars on this? Or like who's funding? Um, so uh, the companies that I have are 501c3 nonprofits. Oh. Um, I have we have uh, we you know we did have a group of angels called the Harvard Angels uh, as our VC interests. And no interest in being the guy who makes um, meat for people to eat. They did not have interest. No, we we not, not at first. We made a house out of it and uh, and leather belts and shoes and other. It's a longer story. We were working on industrial products made from meat that gets cured into uh, leather. Articulated swine leather. That's you can control the geometries. You print meat, so making leather from petroleum products or from sentient beings. We make meat from meat, uh, just in test tubes. But it's uh, it's it's very expensive and uh, and it's horrible. It's it, you know even with a pound of sugar, it doesn't taste the same. It's nutrition wise, it will deliver what you need, but we're not there. No one's there. Uh, that's why there's a big prize for it. But having the X Prize, so uh, having what you, you guys seen the X Prizes? What's the X Prize? Uh, I've seen it. I'm not sure I'm comfortable signing it. Well, okay. It's an incentive to get people to produce technologies that were very difficult to produce before. So innovation, like I guess what we're learning about here, innovation is thinking outside of the proverbial box is having the courage to say and do something that no one else would normally do. Uh, X Prize allows people to kind of, when they have a custom, allows people to make some of these products like uh, a, a, a current space program that you saw Elon Musk produce and uh, dock with the International Space Station, the Dragon Capsule. His company, SpaceX, won the X Prize and Bert Vuitton, who was the other one, was the first private company to go into outer space to leave the Earth's orbit. So the X Prize is, if you can do that, we'll give you a million, ten million, whatever it is. So companies get competitive through this form of, comp through this, these prizes, that creates incentives for us to be creative and think outside the box. Because if you were an engineer at General Motors and you said you wanted to make a, a car that was soft and that you, or you wanted to make a car that no one would ever die again, uh, a vehicle designed principally so that no one would ever be killed, you'd be fired. You say, what, what happened to you, Ted? Did you, what, did you wake up this morning and have some dream? We're just going to make all our cars super safe? What kind of fantasy is that? And you're still talking about it? And now you're showing us drawings? You're wasting our time. Go back to that uh, door design we asked you to do last week. Ted. Oh, the CEO does it? Well, what happens when the CEO does that? Hey! We're going to make cars that make it impossible for people to die in again. I mean, they will never die in these cars. So what happens when a CEO does that? The board, the stakeholders, the, the people who have stock in the company go, really? Well, that's great. Are we going to make our money back? And lots of it. And I want to see growth in this quarter with our super safe cars. Are they going to cost more than regular cars? Do, do they usually do that? So at MIT, when we were working on uh, we were making a car of the future, which is kind of a ridiculous term, uh, we didn't end up doing it. But uh, before us, the group invented something called the airbag, and that was sponsored by General Motors, and that was that was direct capital to give to a group of people to come up with uh, safety mechanisms for cars. It would be a crime if General Motors owned that patent along with MIT and it only belonged to GM cars. So certain inventions we do not think belong to any single company or any VC or private investor. There's nothing wrong with, with that with that mechanism for financing. In many cases, it does work, but sometimes you come across an invention or a concept that shouldn't have borders and shouldn't have uh, any particular person generating the most amount of money from it. it there is no individual that makes a ton of money off of airbags, and it, and actually it just generated lots of doctoral students and engineers studying the process and getting them, refining them, making them better because the patent was open. So, uh, time release medication, solid state memory, radar, these are early patents too that also kind of opened up below. Radar, they were protected by the military. I keep thinking about James Lovelock. 
Yeah, go. And the algae that you do with, how does that fit into this, like, what you're talking about going with the climate change where we started and, and then the techno, <coughs> the, what do you call it, the techno? Technotopic? Technotopic. Well, okay, so, so James Lovelock uh, was known for giving us a picture of the Earth uh, that was that was that was a paradigm shift. So when uh, when we first saw that little blue ball, you know, taken from uh, space, that was a, that was a huge change. Some make the argument it wasn't. Marshall McLuhan, others say it was, but uh, that we can finally see that the Earth not only was it round, but that we all lived on it. And Gaia theory or Gaia theory, I never know which one it is, but uh, Lovelock specifically pointed and said that the Earth, in and of itself, is one super organism. Is one massive form of life encapsulated in this, this very clear picture. So everything has a consequence. You push a button one place, another button gets set off someplace else. Everything is reliant upon one another in a great and intricate lattice or web. And that was kind of his point. Um, so what would so so he's been very much uh, kind of a big advocate for issues of um, life cycle analysis and and retooling our economy so that we can uh, change our ways, be more environmental, because he realized that we have a limited capacity on the Earth. Um, he was supported by this guy, uh, Wackernagel and Reese, which there's two of them, who wrote another, uh, another kind of important book or theory called uh, The Ecological Footprint or Carrying Capacities, under the same, he's the same idea that we're in one enclosed system. Mm -hmm. So, so speaking of the algae, the algae keeps coming up in like so algae for fuel kind of thing. Yeah. The so carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide. Well, what? So algae sequestering carbon? What's it? Yeah, I, I, I read read it a long time ago, but um, having something to do with the carbon environment and you know. Okay, well, um, let me. I'll tell you a story about uh, the razor I use, but I'll first answer. Let me let me answer that simply, and then I'll get to why I'm going to tell you a story about a razor. Okay. And then that, the, a lot of these things will then fold over, and I think we'll kind of coalesce. Okay. Uh, algae production for fuel is great, but the cost of uh, petroleum or you know crude will always match it or reduce or or, or be be. Uh, will be less the cost than bioproduction. Pretty much no matter how cheap we can make algae, I guarantee you OPEC will reduce the cost of oil to match it. Um, I, how, this is kind of curious. Uh, you know, under a crisis, we, we are absolutely capable of change. I mentioned that before, before I put up sustainability. But uh, crisis actually is really good for creating change. So if we want to switch over, everyone driving around in algae cars, you know how long it would take? Or electric cars for that matter. And there's also other things about the ocean. When Pearl Harbor happened, it took Congress three days to retool our entire industry, to start making more equipment, to conserve energy, and to rethink our, our food systems and our water systems three days to get their act together, shake hands and sign bills and put it into policy. One big emergency act. We were attacked by a foreign power. Three days. They stopped their bullshit and got, got their act together. The rest of us flew in line. So, if there was a crisis, something that we viscerally understood as a very threat to our being, we could put any one of these plans into place. And there are libraries filled with Ideas about wind turbines, ideas about uh, you know plasma gasification so advanced that you know trash just disappears. Uh, ideas about uh, infinite battery storage because batteries are an issue, not made from rare earth metals. Uh, ideas, all of these kinds of concepts certainly could be put into place if we had a good crisis. So all you need is just to wipe out a few million people instantly in a very scary manner. And maybe that will work. Although we've had examples of crises before, um, you know, the, the golf spill. That was pretty nasty. Guys, remember that? Why are you shaking your hands? Yeah, no, it was horrible. Horrible. But we didn't do a goddamn thing about it. We, uh, I was there at the Aspen Institute with National Geographic. They put together this assembly of all kinds of people, creative types and 
uh, scientists, whatever, saying, how, what are we going to do about this goddamn oil spill? So, we had, we had everyone there, including uh, Shell and BP. They came out. That was really hard work for those companies. And I met these guys a billion times. They sponsor, and Shell sponsors TED. <laughs> all those good ideas are coming from people, are, it's all like oil money, and TED taking it. Actually, TED takes a lot of that. Well, some of it's in, you know, alcohol, like doers or whatever. But some of you playing with that. They, these guys are washing themselves in this stuff. Uh, but here they were. Uh, we we're all talking about the oil spill, and Kevin Costner was there. You know what? If I, got, I will talk about the Kevin Costner story, but I've got to explain my razor story. Otherwise, I will, I will have gone off on a tangent that will... I'll go back to Kevin Costner and sustainability. Here, here is the point of what I think a lot that needs to happen on some level. Um, I use this razor. I'll put up this. This is us. Actually, I'll put this up. Here we go. Gillette Mach 5. Uh, Mach 5. No, it's spelled right. Whoops. Whoa. There we go. Look at that beauty. That's what I want to show, though. This is a fusion. Okay. It looks like a robot. So the 14-year-old boy in me just is instantly <coughs> in love with this razor. My wife also uses it, but she uses one that's pink in color. We're both architects. We're smart enough to know better. However, we're stuck on this product. So what is it? The Gillette Mach 5. Is this in German or something? Or is it? Gillette Mach 5 this is a huge power with a battery in it. I actually have a custom one. No, it's okay. So I use this product, and there's nothing green about that razor. There's nothing ecological about that razor. I, I dare you, I, I would love for you guys, guys, actually to find out and tell me what is green about this product. This is everything America, this is the Hummer of razors. Okay? It is, it is quadruply packaged. It actually comes, it comes in a, in a shiny mirror case that's made out of all plastic, that has no other function except for that when you keep it in your medicine cabinet, the razor can kind of stand there and kind of glisten into this case. Like a little, little thrum for your razor. You don't need the case. And there's some excuse you can put store blades in the case in the back, but you really don't need that extra plastic to do that. So it's also a series of die cast metals. Incredible amounts of power uh, are used to make these super thin blades. There is no way you can recycle it. It is not designed for disassembly. It's going to fuse together. And, you know, it, it definitely breaks. It has a strip. Uh, you can see here. When that turns to white, what does it mean? No good. Get another one. No good. The razor still works perfectly. But as soon as it turns to white, you're thinking, oh, not optimal. Uh, I better buy another $14 thing. Now, why would some guy like me, who's very serious about ecological uh, design, possibly use this razor? I'll tell you why. It's my face. It's my face. There come, there's the border of my value systems. If I use the eco <laughs> designed by, I don't know, somebody, some yeah, bearded guy. <laughs> <laughs> I actually just had my shirt the other day. I got to meet relatives, so. Coming as a scruffy professor. Uh, yeah, I do shave, but the um, you know, bearded guy making the razor. Uh, there's no way I'm going to use that razor because it's not the best razor you can buy. My wife, too, for her legs or whatever, and armpits because people tell you that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to do it, but there it is. So we bought into this American thing. So, if you want to make a green economy, Here's some here, here's a blueprint. That's it. This works really well. They sell a ton of these things. Because they perform perfectly for what technology provides. So if you want to make a, a um, if you want to beat this out, you need to engineer, design, conceptualize, communicate, promote, sell, whatever it is, the exact same kind of razor that's built on technologies that are in harmony with the Earth's metabolic system, that do things in a manner that is incredibly green, and we'll talk about positive impacts, 
but makes an absolutely green product. But doesn't say so on the label anywhere. Maybe in small letters and fine print. Uh, and at the point of purchase, well, actually, let me add this: works better than this razor. And at the point of purchase, is cheaper. That's it. It works better. It's cheaper, and it happens to be radically green in the kind of the undergrid of its creation. That's it. So when Homer Simpson goes to buy the razor, he looks. Uh, you know, I might be Homer Simpson. Looks at the Gillette Mach 5 and goes, "I've been using this razor. It's the best thing for my face." Oh, there's a new one. It's two dollars cheaper. It looks just as cool, but if we have to say that, uh, and uh, and I and I've heard it performs better. Consumer Reports, whatever, and it actually does work a lot better. It leapfrogs. So it's called leapfrogging the previous technology. And that's it. Well, if it's two dollars cheaper, then the average consumer is going to want to look at that as a possible option, anyways. The, absolutely. But you can't possibly, like, if you do it with bread, sell it for three dollars more and say it's green, label it all the way on the top, or organic, or you know, I mean, they're important things. They're obviously important things, but they they have actually d d done the exact opposite. No, no one would have believed ever reading 1984, George Orwell, that we would willingly submit to a system that tells you every single one of your friends and acquaintances where you're located all the time and tons of pictures of you. No one would have ever thought that we would do that freely, openly, and for fun. Not even getting paid to do it. And that people are going to make money off of you. Billionaires produced overnight. So there wasn't even a passive-aggressive like that. So I think our goals are pretty clear. That that's what that this is this is what they all tell you when, when you get an MBA. This is a super product that actually had a decent price point. They spent a couple of millions in R and D to get it right, and there it is. When it came out, it was an industrially designed masterpiece. Uh, you know, we can improve razors. I'm just using it as an example. However, it caught on kind of the best thing. So we do this with cars, shoes, phones microphones, laptops, houses, and almost everything to some degree. And you know, the bigger the system is, there's different kinds of effectors and relationships and policies. But they're the the ones that work are the ones that are follow that economic market. Now, I, you know, if this will fail if we produce zillions of them because we have a growth economy. So even if it is the greenest razor on earth, the only way it's gonna work is if it's look well, this kind of model. positive ecological model. Um, okay, so uh, whatever that might mean. Let me, let's go on to some philosophy about the word sustainability before I even break into this. Thing. What is, you know, what is, what does sustainability mean to you guys? This whole talk, I've been talking about this stuff. And I, I am still highly critical of everything. I would like to know what's better than the razor. That's my strongest argument that I can think of for what works or doesn't work. But uh, a lot of this falls under this rubric of sustainability. So we hear, hear that term all the time. So what, what face value, what does sustainability mean? Quality. It means quality? Me. Quality. Okay. Like what? Like how? You're going to use it. You're not, gonna, you're not buying it because of any sort of gimmick that may be attached to it. It's... Um, you need it, you want it, you, you have all these reasons for it. It lasts, it's um, okay. made well. It's okay, interesting. Okay. So, would, this, would they try and sell this camera, say it's a sustainable camera? It's like a, the original toaster that your grandmother would have passed down. Original toaster, I love that. Okay, so that would be the original toaster that grandmother would pass down. You're going to love this toaster. Poster project. Okay, there it is. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Okay, so that's what the, so the grandma toaster. 
Okay, well, what, what, does, what does the word sustainable mean? Use it in the context. Of, the durability and longevity. Durability and longevity. Okay. And I more think of sustainability in terms of practice it is less in terms of products. Like, uh -huh. it just doesn't make much sense to me to think of sustainable products, but a sustainable practice of my purchasing this product makes sense to me. Okay. Something that doesn't leave a destructive footprint. Doesn't leave a destructive footprint. Okay. I think of like balance. Balance. Okay, ba balance. It's a balance. Okay, balance, not destructive. You guys want to chime in? I wonder if sustainability is possible in a consuming model. And I'm, I'm very surprised because I'm listening about objects, consuming objects. Yes. I, and even objects that yep. I never seen in my entire life like this <laughs> bottle can. Okay. So, uh, uh, of course I'm not from America, I'm from a Martian country. So, I wonder if... You come from where? Russian? From, no, from Argentina. Because okay. Virgin. So, oh, okay. a Martian country. So, I wonder if... Uh, is it possible in a consuming model. Uh, I I wonder if uh, we shouldn't we talk about sustainability but uh, changing the model. I think that it's a question of model. Okay, I, well model I, I totally agree with you. So, so so what is what is sustainability first? And then we'll we'll figure out the change part later. What I think it? that we have to change the the system of objects. I, I think that we I have no <laughs> no cell phone. I I don't need cell phone. Uh -huh. It's a question of what you need. Uh, if we change the the things that we need, maybe we can change the world. Um, okay, value system. Yeah, it's a value system. Value system. People who value shaving their legs are told that's a value system. That's a cultural thing. We don't need to shave our legs to survive. Yeah. Or our faces. Or whatever. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, do you want to chime in on sustainability? Well, I guess I think of it as a combination of what's been said already. Like the practices behind, you know, the practices of production, um, all aspects of it with the durability. So obsolescence isn't so much an issue. Okay. Okay, I think all of you kind of got it right. Um, and I'm going I'm to put it to you in, in, a, in a slightly new way. Uh, I'd be curious to see what you think. Um, your marriage is sustainable. I'm not talking about objects anymore. You have a sustainable marriage. Mm -hmm. You wake up in the morning and you look over and you think, all I need to do is get through this month. <laughs> Four <laughs> more years. <laughs> <laughs> um, those of you might not know, uh, a sustainable, a sustainable baseball team would be something like the Chicago Cubs. They're good enough to play in the major leagues, but they, and they can continue to play forever. But they don't win. They don't evolve. They're not loving. They're not heroic. They're not forces of change. They're not uh, a kind of a, a, an immense desire line to the next thing, whatever that might be. None, none of that, to me, means sustainable. So they, they do do the job, and they can play baseball for infinity. Uh, just not very good. They just do it in a durable-like fashion where they're not destroying the game, but they continue to do it. I, I think that sustainability is, is a very status quo-like term. There are all the good things that we've said about it, but it's 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 not a, uh, a a positive force necessarily. It's a positive force. It is not a, a force of change or a, a will to be. Sustain as the word just means getting by, getting by, doing it successfully, maybe for generations, and doing it with, with minimal consequence. But it's but we might be too late for this. We are too late. But I'm not going to say the world's ending. But we might be too late for something like sustaining. I never use the term sustainability. 
I, I, I use it in a kind of parochial sense. I try to avoid it. It's very good for business to say sustainability, but it's not something that is uh, a kind of proactive model, which is what I mean when I say positive ecological model. So there's a toaster guy. Uh, let, me get to the, let me get to the toaster, but hold on, let me first show you this guy. Uh, no impact man. Here he is. He's a, some of you might know this is the best picture of him. So I, I often do, I get sometimes on the lecture circuit, we get stuck together, no impact man and me. <laughs> and uh, no impact man, I can't believe someone would is like it, live their lives to achieve no impact. But that's kind of where we're at. I, I, I have done nothing. I am no impact. <laughs> and I'm proud. And it, we're at the state of uh, this kind of sustainable kind of culture, society, where, where this is now considered a virtue on some level. That this guy, uh, and it's a w wonderful story, but I'm repulsed by him as a human. <laughs> this, is, this is his child and his wife that he because he's writing his book that he forces in a kind of semi-gentle, passive aggressive way to living the no-impact lifestyle. For instance, they can't use an elevator. So, you know, if you see the documentary, as soon as the cameras turn away, the wife uses the elevator and goes up. They don't use diapers, or they try and reduce the amount of diapers, period. Um, you know what? I understand that diapers are a horrible waste on society plastic versus cloth. I get it. I totally get it. People in the, the kind of in, in sub-Saharan Africa don't never use diapers of any kind. There's this beautiful movie, I think it's called Babies, <coughs> about rearing children all over the globe. It's just incredible. A little baby just pees on mommy's leg and you get some dirt, you rub it, clean the leg, and get some dirt, clean the back of the baby, and it's totally natural. Um, for you know the society that I live in, that's not possible. They're, they live in New York City. So the, when the, she was a little girl, she wasn't allowed to have diapers. Not allowed. He basically did everything he can so that he, he would have no footprint or effect on the earth. And so you could read his his kind of his series of idioms that you know allows him to be who he is. But I think that's the exact wrong message, though. Not because it's just a it's completely neutral, but. Uh, because you, uh, but because it has no positive effect. And this is not going to help us. It's just what does it keeps us exactly where we are. And if we have created all this corruption and pollution and all the problematics that we have set before us, then this isn't going to help. It's not as bad, though, as something called efficiency. Uh, I don't have a slide, but we can. Efficiency is the, is, is, um, the other thing we often say. This car is efficient. It uses gasoline, but less of it. It used to use eight gallons to go one mile. Now it uses <coughs> 28 gallons to go one mile, but still using gasoline. So how the hell is that happening, affecting the system? It's not. It's just it's just reducing the time it takes to our to some level of failure. Efficiency is is an optimization. These kinds of terms are pretty ugly. Okay. In fact, there's a better word for efficiency. It's called less bad. William McDonough and a book, Cradle to Cradle, uh, is kind of like the father of that philosophy. Cradle to Cradle being a term saying nothing, nothing has an end of life scenario. It just cycles and lives. Efficiency in, in engineering schools is kind of goal. It's not good. So efficiency is even worse than no impact. So what we want to achieve is something called a positive ecological model. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm not the dictator. Uh, I'm just, I'm just uh, I'm making an assertion. Positive ecological model is a razor that works better than the Gillette Mach 5. It's super green to produce it. And when you use it, cleans the water as it passes through it. Uh, when you return it to the earth, it provides nutrients for the soil. And grows more raisins. If you grow more raisins. But it, it is something that gives back. A fuel cell vehicle, as air, as air is uh, kind of swooped in, the intake, it processes the air and it's cleaner on the outside when it, when it passes through the fuel cell. 
when it, it when it when it, when it releases uh, uh, it, uh, sorry an effluent that it would produce would be something like water as well as it breaks up hydrogen drinkable potable water a factory that makes a carpet like this except for the dyes that it uses and the cotton and everything that it produces actually makes a product that uh, when it returns to the land is, uh, certainly gives back more than it took and as it's being made the water that was used to make it in the process actually comes out cleaner so there's an example of something like that I'll show you this is a positive ecological model this is, in other words it's accountable for the 150 years of industrial pollution that's already in existence and the biggest industrial pollution that's in existence is your education <laughs> Uh, and this this uh, this would probably get to a whole other host of points, but more or less, uh, education has been affected by industrialization. Everyone went to school, wherever you are, to become citizens of an industrial society. You are trained to do something to be a valuable member of that society. Uh, that's why uh, gym class, dance class, music class, or band, whatever it is, and art class are always kicked off uh, the kind of, uh, whenever there's a budget problem, kicked out or removed from the curriculum. Because they don't have an industrial value, according to somebody. You know, math and science is good, and maybe some, you know, some, some language to communicate and do business. But we have, a, we have a culture that does everything to stop innovation. So there's a lot of this old pollution in our educational systems. Obviously, if you go out and try and customize your own Education, that's probably a good idea. It's very difficult to do. It's harder, but it's good. Because you break down this kind of the, the network of no. Um, you know, mostly in your education, someone along the line told you, no, you can't do that. No, you can't. Who are you? No, you can't do that. No, you're not good enough. No, you didn't do well. No. Uh, Sir Ken Robinson makes a very good point about industrial education. Uh, his point is, uh, he, his little, he has actually a little story about a kid that starts in kindergarten. And there's this little girl, and she's drawing a picture. And the teacher says, hey, little girl, what are you drawing a picture of? And the, the, uh, you know, the little girl looks at the teacher and goes, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher goes, no, no you, you can't do that. And the little girl goes, but why not? And the teacher goes, because... You know, no one knows what he looks like. How would you know it's right? And the little girl goes, they will in a minute. <laughs> he says, so much that you have been uh, kind of taught has been down these kinds of streams and silos of thinking, and that's okay. Uh, and then many times people tell you to kind of radicalize yourself and go against the system, and you know, maybe that too is also a bromide or a built-in platitude. I don't know. I, I would I'd probably question that too. At the end of the day, there is a map. You're up against the force of other folks that were built in this kind of culture, you know, based on industrial needs. So let me get to this toaster. Yes. Yeah. Until I hang on Kevin Costner, no, I was going Oh, you're hanging on Kevin Costner. Oh, yeah, toaster, right? okay, we'll get to Kevin, <laughs> and I'll do the toaster. I promise I'll get to Kevin. <laughs> so uh, the toaster was based on this culture of no. This is a kid, uh, Royal College of Arts. So he's an art student, but Royal College of Art is an amazing school. Wicked, wicked shit comes out of there. Those people are radically talented. Um, very difficult to get in, but it's very cool. So this kid goes, he's an industrial designer, and he gets into a class where what every industrial designer must do is design the toaster. Not, it's sort of like over to the grandma heirloom kind of thing, but that wasn't it. So he decided, to ask some basic questions. He got courageous. So I'm going to ask some really stupid questions. But uh, why do we need toasters? <laughs> Honestly. Like if you were, if the world ended and you were escaping to, you know, Sasti or some, you know, beautiful island paradise someplace, would you grab like a flashlight and some food and, you know, a toaster? I mean, what, 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 what do toasters do? And how come they only cost like $8.99? How does all of this, not this one, because this has got a story behind but how does all of that shiny metal, bits of electronics, different kinds of plastics, 
uh, a kind of a, a transformer or a ballast. Everything fit inside this whole thing and get built for under 10 bucks. It has no purpose either. I mean, it's really minimal purpose. It just makes you toast. And why? The, and they're rampant. They are just rampant. You can't have a home that. Do you not have a toaster? You have a toaster? No, I don't have a toaster. Don't have a toaster. Okay, I'm moving <laughs> on to Tina. I'm moving on I guess it, that's the answer. That, the Gillette Box 5 razor that's super green and live in Argentina. No, no. Um, I thought it was Brazil. That was, but I guess no. Uh, okay, so, so, you know, and they're all made in China, whatever you want to say. And they're designed for obsolescence. Anyway. So this kid went out and he said, I'm going to make a toaster from scratch. I'm going to go to the very beginnings of the toaster, the primordial soup of time, and create a toaster as if I was a caveman. And I'm going to use my knowledge, uh, and there's another guy who actually built a uh, telecommunications device and the same thing. I'll get to that in a minute if someone reminds me, because I'll probably die one again. I'm going to go and I'm going to mine my own mineral ore. I've traveled all the way up to the northern part of England. I'm going to mine metals with my bare hands. I'm going to make tools to do it. I'm going to extract the ore myself. I'm going to design and build a furnace to heat the ore at like 38,000 degrees or whatever it was, to smelt it. I'm going to build a mold, a casting system. I'm going to build a small circuit board. I'm going to build the electronic components. I'm going to build the entire freaking toaster from scratch. And he goes ahead and he does it. This was one of the variations of the toasters that he produced. It works. It's I mean, like a hammer-like thing. And it fries the toast. Uh, it doesn't work well at all. Um, but he did it. It took him about a year and a half, I think, to bring a lot of these things. There's some great videos. We can see him as he's building a furnace and having all these difficulties to learn all the different technologies that we just take for granted that go into a toaster. You know how much of the landscape it took to produce something like this? Just one person just to make something like that. And we make millions of these things and we throw them out after two years or at least before someone else inherits it. So if that's a toaster, and that's the basic understanding of the, what we call the life cycle of this particular thing, imagine what a city is. Imagine what a town is like. Imagine all these resources and all the extraction systems that we just do without even a second thought on a daily basis for our population. Billions of people every day. I mean, Saspi looks like a, a, a brilliant, peaceful place. And for, for all intents and purposes, it is. But, uh, you know, to get it where it is, I mean, look at the cranes up on these hills, building these villas that are hotels. Uh, I don't want to get into what's evil about Saspi. I, <laughs> I see evil, but not, I don't mean it in any kind of bad way. But, it is, but there's a lot of things happening here at the elevation that we're at to possibly create more than sustaining our lives, but actually something that's beautiful and filled with desire and takes a lot of energy to produce. So the, the toaster project, I think, and this, and he has many other versions of it, I think gives us a very good, this is a great semiotic of uh, kind of an everyday thing where you're, you totally are accountable for its entire making. Uh, Kevin Costner, so we're, we're up in Aspen talking about the oil spill. I, I actually wanted to get to this in, in one of the slides that I had. So. Who was the artist of that test, Dragon? Um, I don't remember the name, but he, he published a book on Princeton Architectural Press. He's a kid from the Royal College of, uh, of Art, the RCA in London, Royal College of Arts. It's called The Toaster Project. <laughs> Perfectly named. Perfect brand, if you want to call it that, the whole thing. Very cool. Uh, okay, so here's the oil spill that we're confronting. Those are those are massive boats. Just to give you a few notes, you can't see it so well in here. Yeah, that's the the, the flames of the uh, what was it called? Not the was it the Event Horizon? Or that's the movie. What was the name of the oil rig? The, the something Horizon. Was it the Exxon? 
the, the, the BP, no, it was BP, British Petroleum, but it was, it was something horizon, whatever it was. There it is, bursting in flames, blowing out all this oil. So we had the President of the United States, the Chief Science Advisor, the entire United States military, the, uh, a few admirals, the uh, British Petroleum, CEO, all of his executives and top engineers, and then outside consultants, the finest minds that the world can possibly produce, because money was no object to stop this spill. And you probably read about it in the papers, or I'll remind you of a few things. But here it was. Here's that crisis I was talking about. That's going to get us to start making those new Gillette Mach 5 razors and doing it right, or getting us into a positive ecological economy. So here's this giant thing that's happening, and we all fly up to Aspen, Colorado, because it's good to expend jet fuel to talk about the environment. And we get up there and we say, hey, what can we do? And ideas, and there's separate meeting rooms, and, and everyone's arguing. The National Geographic people were sponsoring it because one of the things they wanted to do is take photos of dead animals, flora and fauna, but they wanted megafauna, because people relate to dead megafauna, like you would not believe. A bunch of dolphins wrapped in oils, you know, choking, some birds, some, something like, something that we can, you know, plankton dead doesn't mean anything to us. So National Geographic wanted to do its spin, it has its own reasons. So here we were trying, you know, working on solving the problem, and there was James Cameron and, and uh, Kevin Costner. But James Cameron, we'll put him aside, I was very upset that these guys were there, not totally upset, I mean it was cool that they were there, but really didn't know what they could possibly contribute, and I knew that Kevin Costner, he lives there in Aspen. So he just marched down from a billion dollar mansion, right. and uh, it's no big deal. He, ha he has a daughter that is incredibly beautiful and wicked smart. Just, I don't know where she came from, I think he was adopted or something like that. And he's a nice guy. She is clearly, she's always been doing a lot of good work. I've heard about what she's been doing for years. So she was there, so that meant, okay, something intelligent would be said from that man, maybe to her, I, I don't know. But um, anyway, I showed up to when it was his turn to give a talk, and he had given a talk in Congress that I was aware of uh, about this bill. And so did James Cameron. And, and Kevin Costner turned out to be um, a very smart man and a great American. And I, don't, I would never think I would say that, because I had spent years making fun of movies like Waterworld. And, and I always kind of pointed, I, he was like great for things that I needed to point out as problematic. <laughs> and and uh, so here he was. He said that he, in, in 1997, the Exxon Valdez spill, he uh, met a friend, an engineer from MIT, uh, that had a device that wasn't rocket science. There are many versions of it, but what it did is separate oil from water. And Valdez spill happened. He said, sure, hey man, I'll give you 20, uh, it was $28 million in 1997 dollars. Um, and you know what? We'll make a company together that makes these machines. And it's so logical because everybody, everybody in the freight business who delivers oil, just like you have a life preserver that you throw out to the water to save a human life, you would have one of these things. If your product was spilling, you'd throw it out there and get your product back. And guess what? It wouldn't destroy the environment. So this seems like a really smart thing to make. So they made a manufacturing and filled up a warehouse with them and didn't sell any of them. Lost a lot of money. So this happens, and he, because he is, you know, uh, some Hollywood person, he has access to Congress, gives a, a presentation, and says, I will give you, uh, you know, 60 of my machines to s stop the spill from proliferating. For free. That's it. For free. So what happened? Why did they, we not decide to let Kevin Costner give us those machines to separate oil from water and extract it from that massive spill that was going on? Is it because there's no mechanism for institutionally processing a donation like that? That's a very good answer, but no, but that's a very good answer. Now, while I've been thinking about that, right after him was um, James Cameron. James Cameron, just a month or two ago, was one of three, I think he was a third person, maybe the fourth, to travel the deepest ever on the, uh, on the planet Earth into the Marianas Trench in a submersible. 
I think it was the third person. Picard was one of the most famous ones. He became the Enterprise's captain for Star Trek fans. They, so he he made a sub. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a vertical submersible. It's the coolest thing you've ever seen. So instead of a horizontal system, which was Picard, he did a vertical submersible, and he went in it himself in an experimental submarine that he built that he had been working on for 15, 20 years, and he went the deepest man has ever gone. He's actually traveled to the point, more people have been to the moon than have been to the deepest point in the Earth. So he is now a super amazing explorer. He built all this equipment and supplied Hollywood money to researchers who were uh, uh, hell-bent on getting into deep ocean exploration. He made a movie, Titanic, and used a lot of his equipment to get amazing shots of the of, the, of the, the actual Titanic, but he was kind of obsessed working with scientists and getting into this deep ocean stuff. So when he was there, he said, hey, you want an accurate reading of this spill? I've got all kinds of devices that I will give you for free. I'll go down and stare right at the mouth of it. I'll take high resolution Titanic quality photo. <laughs> like a film, sorry, of the entire event. Well, hell, I'll do it in 3D, probably. You know. <laughs> so why didn't James Cameron and uh, you know Mr. Dances of Wolves have anything to do with it? Well, uh, I, I guess their their bottom line complaint that wasn't really articulated in the room was that um, you know it would be slightly embarrassing, honestly, if we were saved by some Hollywood guys. <laughs> I mean, truth be told, admirals in our military, genius engineers, scientists, Obama, like his entire reputation, his entire reputation was based on solving this spill. I know a ton of my friends were, everyone was making drawings on how to solve it and, and doing the calcs. It was, it, was, it was quite a challenge. But uh, it'd be really embarrassing if, if um, I would be embarrassed. I, if uh, Kevin Costner saved us, but, but it was there. So what happened was that uh, three of his machines were tested. That was the answer. And they were 97% effective, which wasn't enough, according to BP and, and some others. And that they also accused him of, and this goes a little bit to what you're saying, of that he would profit, if, uh, he would profit greatly in advertising and promotion and sell a lot of his machines if they were used in this manner. So, well, you know, it goes back to that Pepsi thing and the electric bikes, but it's kind of in the inverse. Um, in fact, it's, it's, it's a contrapositive model, I think. It's just so strange that, and then it didn't happen. So I was really proud of Kevin Costner. Uh, and, and at the time, James Cameron's, uh, he was only making claims that hadn't been proven that what he I mean, we knew that he could take a film with the Titanic. It just, there was the reason James Cameron wasn't allowed to do it is that what if James Cameron died or crew members of his died? It would just be a tragedy. Yep. So, making decisions specifically? Uh, it was the president's cabinet as a special assignment, uh, military and scientists that were officially. Uh, congressmen were officially in charge doing it, but they were, uh, it was BP's operation and BP's property, so BP had the right to do everything first and have the first signals on, on how they wanted to approach it. So it was, it was kind of a quasi-relationship between government and corporations and some very, and uh, slightly shady decision process that went on and on. And that's the thing, that's the slightly shady decision process. Yeah. That is, that is a big thing, isn't it? Um, anyway, it turned out that you, you read in the papers just about a month or two ago that the, the, one of the, uh, uh, the, the oil rig uh, engineers had erased a lot of his text messages uh, about the actual flow rate of the spill. And uh, he's you know, now up for, uh, he's going to get jail time for not releasing the true amount. It was something. It was it was unbelievably disgusting. It was uh, like 50 or 80 times what they were even estimating, and they knew it. So, it was, 
But, uh, you know, it's kind of curious. It's sort of hidden, right? I, I thought Ge National Geographic, even though they tried really hard, they spent a lot of money getting really great photographers and reporters, uh, journalists, what, you know, to come and kind of record this. But it just faded away. This crisis really didn't stick. Valdez was more effective. He had a big boat and lots of Alaskan shoreline. Well, do you think that that's just because of the rate of, of news and the amount of news as compared to you know when the Valdez happened? It's a great question. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I, I, is the media tired of it? Did, well, I think first I think page news for. Yeah, well, that was the problem. It was, it was first page news for like two weeks, and it was just an onslaught of you know media coverage on on every angle. And I, I, but I, I think that I mean with this and, and other issues, and I know this is you know another topic for another day, but um, it, it seems like media nowadays, especially with coverage like this, um, just go whole hog for a, a very intense period of time. To where you know you, you talk about being numb to, to advertising, yeah, yeah. Uh, you almost become numb to news at times just because it's so much and from so many different areas and so many different angles that you finally you know hit that brick wall of like, all right, I need I need to focus on something else. Okay, what do you guys think of that point? I like that point. The media was over it was over over saturation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I'm not hitting on the right point. Where did this story come? Why was this story coming? Why didn't anyone cover the, the Aspen Institute? Institute and they had their own publication also. Well, it, no, it was covered. Oh, it was. It was I mean, National Geographic led the force, but it was open to anybody on the planet. Earth. There were a lot of uh, environments. But I'm saying with our own media. I mean, it was National Geographic. And it can specialize, but it wasn't. It's not that, <coughs> that that's not mainstream. Um, I see what you mean. I'm saying, uh, like, the journalist perspective that's getting reported. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was a room like this. It was exactly like this, and, and many different rooms with people. It's about this same size, and then they they put they put oil people in with you know scientists or whatever together in these rooms, and then they had a larger room that was about 200. It wasn't like a. I mean, the media likes you know an event of some sort where it's there's you know either one person shouting on a podium or or a group making. It was a it was a think tank situation, so I guess that it's kind of it's just it's talking heads. Maybe it wasn't exciting enough. I don't know. It's a good good point. I mean, it's also Aspen, Colorado. Well, coming from just a journalistic background, yeah. it's, just, it's definitely newsworthy enough where our journalism needs to be yeah. inspired by. I was definitely interested in this. I've covered it and like yeah. following it, so I don't I don't know why. No, it was I covered. It was, there's, there's, but it was just like they were talking about. Oh yeah, Kevin Costner today, and I mean they were focusing on you know the the big names because I, I remember hearing about that. that yeah, story. he did get a lot of uh, press when he presented. Um, yeah, and presented that year in Congress. Yeah, no, I remember that. Yeah, in terms of public response, um, it came on the heels kind of of Katrina and um, the Haiti crisis also, and they checked it up more than what media had done for the crisis, so uh, it, I found it difficult reading the article because they were very scientific, uh, what what they printed, what, what the media about the oil spill. About the oil spill. Yeah, interesting. The, uh, I, you know, um, they did, they did, they did have a lot of details. I guess everyone was really into the, I was into the, I was, we were designing these big soft socks that would have heavy rain, so I, everyone you know, that came up, but um, met, you know, maybe I can't really place a finger on the pulse of why uh, the media. I mean, maybe it was the oversaturation. I, what I what I think is that they didn't have the big picture of destruction. Katrina had it. Of destruction. Destruction. Mm -hmm. Katrina had it. Fukushima has it, uh, and um, uh, uh, you just mentioned Haiti, Haiti had it. Uh, you know, there's. When you see lots of death and destroyed things, it's almost to the point where it's got to be so much even more than we've seen before before you pay attention. And then, uh, and then that that it didn't have it here. It had you know fishermen that were just saying you know yeah. talking about lawsuits exactly, and no one no one really. And then act, the the real science behind it is that the um, the actual dangerous part of the uh, Leakage, the crude oil, or these um, 
they were invisible, uh, uh, kind of a visible mixture of chemicals uh, and um, gases that were patches in the water that had no way, to, you can't take pictures of them, but it's the kind, that was the most dangerous component that would suck out oxygen for, uh, or carbon, depending on what it was, uh, for other life forms to exist. And that, I do remember reading that in, in the sciences, that that was worse than the actual spill itself. So a non-photographable you know, series of bubbles and gases that were uh, released at this, you know, inside the Gulf. And that was, um, so that I, I, I would think that if there was a big nasty picture of a lot of destruction, then people could rally. But it didn't, it, it, the press was out there. I mean, everyone was there. They just didn't have it. Just didn't have, National Geographic spent a fortune on, on a, um, an infogram section through the history and evolution of the Gulf and the different sediment layers and different layers of the food chain and how they rely upon each other and they made it they made it technical yet simple enough so Homer Simpson could understand it but, and what the oil does to each specific layer and how long that damage impacts and they go like wow great it's horrible I don't know I guess. done I, I, I don't know I don't know what you guys think, but uh, it, it didn't, it's a, a kind of a very um, blunted uh, uh, effect. It's something far away that is, that's, that's not in our own country, like Fukushima, which didn't probably do as much damage on some level. We, we connected with better because we had great pictures of this, this melted core of a plant from the tsunami and just the idea of nuclear destruction seems that much more visceral and evil. And Actually, you know, the business, like everything else in there, making money off of these stories that are going to be more interesting. That the oil people are a business. Uh, or journalism oh, itself. Journalism. Is, uh, what are people attracted to? What stories do they want to read? Right. Any sense? If it bleeds, it bleeds. Or oh, no, anything. No. That's some sort of explanation. Yeah. And, and, and it was, I mean, the, the uh, sorry, just wanted to come in. But, um, it, it seems like, you know, uh, what you're describing with Haiti, Haiti and, and all that, those were instantaneous kinds of, of scenarios where, uh, like, a big bang happened. And, you know, the, the oil spill, I remember, you know, going into day 90. And, and you just, at the same time, you know, you, you reach that, that point where it's like, you know, you, you almost sort of give up on, on you know, is it, is it going to be solved? Either? Okay, so, you, so now what I'm hearing, I know you wanted to jump in, but imagine an earthquake going for 90 days. Yeah. And that's what it was. So you're saying that was just so much we were just shocked. Well, from a media standpoint, yeah. I mean, because it, with, especially with developments being very slow uh, in, in that process, um, you know, you're, how are you going to keep you know, some of the tension? Well, maybe, good point, uh, but maybe we just simply can't comprehend it. I just asked you guys how much trash New York City produces in one day, and to give me a picture of what that would be like. Like that, just to give, just to, how much waste do we poop out? Now, so here's this thing, like Satan's <laughs> vomit, whatever it is, into, um, <laughs> I don't know, where did you guys that now? <laughs> You're used to it. So maybe it was just this 90 days of horror. We just couldn't. Bah, that's possible. It's just oh my God! It's like it's going. I mean, we, we get sick of American Idol, and there was like hope. There's just one brilliant singer after the next. So like, oh God, it's so much talent. <laughs> <laughs> and so here's like so much destruction. You can't take. What do you want to say? So yeah, um, I, I, I'd like to. Just briefly said something about the uh, history of uh, Fukushima versus uh, the Gulf spill, okay, which good. is there's resident microbes that are natural to the Gulf. You know, they live in warm water, they eat long chains of carbon. Yep. Um, they do eat the oxygen, or they consume the oxygen in the process of eating carbon. They're aerobic heterotrophs. Uh, nature evolved those, and th this is nothing new to them. And so, like, this probably sucks for our generation, whereas there's nothing that nature's produced that can accelerate the rate at which radioactive uh, uh, nuclei decay. So yeah. those okay. problems will stick uh, with the planet for much longer than the North. So. Okay. Um, the last quick point.
Yeah, you can go ahead. Um, it's just about the media thing, just jump up, just for a perspective outside of the U.S. sort of media sphere. Because um, I was in, I was working in Great Britain around the time that that happened. Yeah. And it was interesting that there was a lot of coverage there. Almost none of it was about the environmental impact of the spill. It was almost all about kind of na their national outrage that a U.K. company was being you know, told what to do by the U.S. government and the effect that this would all have on the pound versus the dollar. Very important yeah. now. Economics. And that, that that was the bottom line. The bottom line was the bottom line. Yeah, no, I do remember a lot of that. How much it was going to cost to clean up and we're going to sue everybody. Um, I, I think the next one that comes along uh, there, there will. Okay, so maybe we'll talk about this after lunch. Uh, obviously, if growth continues the way it's growing, we want to we want to have our economy be ten times bigger than it is now within five years. Where our population was just we get more old, more elderly people because we're getting really good with medicine. Uh, the developing world is having more uh, pregnancies ever before and you make these claims. They're actually not new claims. They started with the Club of Rome, uh, I, was, I want to say in the 60s, I think it was. Um, and, there's, and, and, and we've been hearing about Malthusian population growth forever. Some may make arguments that there's nothing wrong with more people. And you've never seen, have you ever seen an ant out of work? If the colony produces more ants, there's just more jobs to go around. So why don't humans have the same problem? Well, did you ever notice that when a population of ants gets to a certain size, what happens? They eat each other. They die off. <laughs> they go into a, a, form, a form of suicide. And it, mostly because all the nutrients around them are completely gone. They're wiping themselves out. So I guess that, that's, that's just part of what we call disturbance in ecology. Uh, I, all right, we're gonna get lunch, but this this is I mean, this we so I got this award called Google Artist a few years back. I don't know how I got it, but I guess I was producing a lot of these things. And this this shows one hour's worth of trash in the city of New York. I think it was thirty six thousand tons of trash per day. This is one hour's worth of compacted waste that we make in New York City. So I, if I was an alien species, you know, in some spaceship peering down at New York City, I thought, I would think it, it was basically a, a mechanism designed to produce trash or produce these large sanitary fills that used to be in Staten Island, but now we send it to Ohio. Standard. 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 Yeah. Standard. Yeah. 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 So this is, this is a way of communicating what would be um, very difficult to understand. And something like showing how much the oil, the crude oil releasing that still was producing was, was desperately needed at the time. And no one's able to do that. Uh, I heard a, another statistic about coffins. We can look at this later, but look at death. Death is, being, death is a great subject. Uh, how we bury our dead. So we use all kinds of cosmetics, chemicals, embalmments, uh, preservatives to keep people when they're dead looking like they're alive for just a few moments. Talk about design for obsolescence. It's already an obsolete, obsolete object, sorry. Uh, and then we, we puff it up so it looks good. And we put it in this chrome and steel and maple wood box and bury it. So I think per year in the United States of America, just the metallic components and coffins alone could make a San Francisco bridge. But we have spirits and cultural memory that kind of overtakes the pragmatism that you're talking about, which in the case of death. You mean metal, metal and coffins? You mean the, the chrome? And the yeah, like I mean, you know, it's more important vis-a-vis death, what our oh, beliefs are. I agree. Our beliefs are very strong. Beliefs are strong. Our values. 
But I, I have some alternatives, and I've seen some other alternatives, and we're going to look at some some serious uh, some serious issues on that on a very difficult subject. Uh, I think we're I think we're going to leave it at that. So uh, bring your brains back. Uh, we meet again at four o'clock, uh, and we still have to save the world. So that may be your assignment at lunch is figure out how to save the world. Yep. I just looked at James Lovelock again just to figure out what I was trying to ask you. And about a month ago, he admitted recently to being alarmist. No. So he's preaching. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the end of the world scenario. So he has a new opinion that global warming is not occurred as he expected. He's saying that it's, it has not occurred? It has not occurred as he expected, so he's been more of an alarmist. And that was about a month ago. Okay, interesting. I'm not up on what he's up to every month, but that's good. <laughs> we're, all, we're, we're also going to talk about uh, uh, skeptics, period, and skepticism as another philosophy. I mean, we'll, we'll use the environment as the kind of the, the linchpin and the kind of the, or the springboard to discuss it, but there's some big skeptics and, and, what, and how they ride and produce uh, the kind of the world that we live in or kind of the messages in the world that we live in. Uh, Bjorn Lumberg specifically a Danish uh, scientist and philosopher, uh, actually a statistician and philosopher, um, very big skeptic, uh, and he's got some great, great kind of uh, uh, angles. 